somebody who repairs old Caroline systems, and he did have a name for me, and it turns out that the person has passed away. Um, so I don't know whether they'll be able to help us or not, uh, but I'm, I'm guessing no on that. So uh, we, we will continue to find and try to, try to repair that system, but for now, that's what's going on. That's why we won't have bells this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, the other thing is for, uh, what, what is the other thing? What's the other thing? There's nothing. Oh, I know the other thing. The other thing. Sorry, this is Sunday morning. Uh, the other thing is, finally, at long last, we have installed the output for the organ. Unfortunately, it's not quite ready to go yet. But it's in there, it's, it's just about ready, and for those of you on live stream, this is going to make a huge difference to your music, and I know you're looking forward to it very much. We've got the system, the main part is in the organ, Gary emailed me, he's like, there's one more thing, and so we're waiting on the one more thing, we're planning to hook it all up on Monday, test it out. Next Sunday, you should have some really good music at home. Now, that's not permission for everybody to stay home. Um, but it, it's going to be great, and, and that's been a few months as we've been trying to get the system. That is the last component of our permanent live stream system that we need to, to work on and get in place. So, uh, at that point, we will now have the basic system in place, and we will be up to speed. Uh, well, and the only place to go is up then, until something grows. Nothing is going to break. No more breaking. All right. That said, uh, we, we don't have bells this morning, but let's stand and prepare our hearts for worship as we prepare for the open hymn. Oh, bless the Lord, my soul.
As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For your progress and joy in the faith, 
so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel.
we have lots and lots of things that we have to do. Seminary, for those who don't know, is the, the school for pastors. Right? There are lots of steps we have to do, lots of, lots of requirements, lots of hurdles. And one of the things that we have to pass is a time of psychological examination. That's right. I'm mostly certified sane, believe it or not. You meet with a psychologist at the seminary, one who's, one who's actually not even hired by the seminary, but, but placed there by the seminary, in order to try to make sure that if there are pastors coming through, potential pastors who have perhaps some pretty serious mental issues, that, that maybe we deal with those issues first before placing them in a parish uh, to, to try to help the mental condition of the sin in entirely. Well, I met with a psychologist I met him quite a few times, just as, as we're supposed to do. And in this one session, I don't know exactly what, what brought it up or why or how, but I do remember him asking me, do you wish you were dead right now? And I kind of paused. And I said, well, yes, don't you? I don't think that was the answer he was expecting. That line of questioning went on for, for a long time after that point. But I think I finally made clear that I'm not saying I want to be dead right now. I don't have a death wish. I'm certainly not going to go back to my room and do anything to accelerate the process, right? I'm going to do what I can to be here because I do believe that's where God has placed me. But look at this reading from St. Paul where he tells us what the, what the Christian's view is in regard to death. And he makes it very clear. He says, you know what? To be with Christ is better. Can't get around that. It is far better for us to depart and be with Christ. But, Paul says, while we're here, we have a mission. And we live to the Lord. And that means in the time he's given us here on earth, we are the Lord's. And not only has he given us a purpose, but he's given us a mission and a goal. And the difference then between the Christian and the non-Christian becomes just this. We are not afraid of death. If you look out into the non-Christian world, death is considered the worst thing that can happen. At least if you're healthy and don't have anything wrong with you. Okay, we can go a long way on what the secular world has made of the, of the value of life right now. That's not the direction this sermon is going to go, but if you want to talk about that with me later, be my guest. The point is that for a regular healthy person with nothing going on, death is seen as the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen. It is something to be avoided at all costs. And I do mean all costs. When we fund things like embryonic stem cell research that takes the life of another for the chance of avoiding death of someone else. We are avoiding death at all costs. I could go on and on with examples, but I think you understand where I'm coming from here, that in the secular world, death is fear. It is more than an enemy. It is the ultimate enemy. And you see this throughout Hollywood as well. Hollywood is just a window into the people's soul, right? You see this in the movies that people like so much. How many movies that are good movies do you know where at the end of the movie the protagonist dies? I can't think of very many. I do have a couple. The Gladiator would be one of them, right? Not too many, though. Most movies, if you want a happy ending, Protagonists have to live. 
because death is to be feared. And even in the movies and films where the protagonist dies, there has to be some sort of some sort of mission, some sort of cause, something, something that the death accomplishes, right? It can't just be a meaningless death. I remember back to an old TV show I'm sure none of you have ever seen called Star Trek The Next Generation. Now this is not the one with Kirk, this is the one with Picard, who is a much better captain. That part is not God's way, that's my name. Right? But if he were here, he would tell you this. No. Anyway, in Star Trek, there, there was a, a, a scene fairly early on in one of the first seasons where one of the main characters actually died. And, like, really died, not just died and then came back later. This happens in Star Trek a lot. All right? But actually died. And this is death was 100% completely meaningless. It didn't have any context to it. It was, it was like a red shirt death, if you've ever seen the original series. You know that when Kirk beat down the planet, he always included one person wearing a red uniform, and you knew that person was beating back up again. Right? Go, go check it out and find out. But that's what kind of death this was for a main character in the show. Now think through your TV shows. This doesn't happen to main characters, does it? You don't have a senseless, meaningless death. And it made a lot of people really, really uncomfortable. Later on, of course, they brought their character back, but whatever, but we won't talk about that. It took a few years. <laughs> the point is, as Christian people, we do not have the same fear. And this is something that's very difficult to get across because it's drilled into you in society that death must be feared. And we look at it and we say, I don't have that fear. It's not there. In fact, I know that when I die, yet shall I live. Because my Savior promised it. And I know that in the end, He will resurrect even my body from the ground where it lies. And I will rejoin body and soul, made perfect, and I will stand in the presence of my God, where there shall be no more weeping or crying, for the former things have passed away. Now I don't fear. What does life become like if we don't fear death? Now, once again, I have to tell you, lest my psychiatrist come out and, and find me and say, ha ah, no, we're not looking to accelerate the process, right? I'm not telling you to take unnecessary risks, to go out and live with abandon and seek death wherever it may be found. That's not the Christian message, people. But the message is that we don't have to be afraid of it. That's countercultural, isn't it? I gave you all the examples, and believe me, we could go on more for another few hours of examples from our culture of people trying to avoid death at all costs. We are different. We are the ones who look and say, if we die, that's far better. Because we'll be with the Lord. But while we live, we live to the Lord. So what does this actually mean? What it means is the same as it meant for the apostles. That we are no longer afraid to worship. We're no longer afraid to gather. We are no longer afraid to speak even in the midst of persecution. You watch what the apostles did, right? The authorities came around and strictly charged them, do not speak in Jesus' name, or we will kill you. And what did the apostles do? 
My, how we have shifted from that today. I think that if we were to get this back into our minds as Christian human beings, if we were to start remembering what the important things are and what the unimportant things are, and if we were to start correctly categorizing death as one of the unimportant things, what an amazing witness we would be to a world who dies without hope. The Bible tells us that it's not necessarily our witness that's going to bring people into Christ. Not necessarily. It tells us that sometimes they will look at us and they will watch us and they will see the hope we have in us. And then they will ask, why do you have such hope? And in that moment, the Bible tells us we will be able to express to them why we are so hopeful, who we know and what he has done. What is it that takes the sting of death away? Why don't you fear death? There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor, getting checked out. There's nothing wrong with surgeries and procedures. Please don't hear me telling you that you need to run along the highway to death. You, you notice I've emphasized this a few times now. There's a reason for that, okay? But what I'm trying to do is, rather than accelerate toward death, I'm trying to take the fear of it away. And that's why this sermon is staying incredibly simple. I'm not going into huge theological concepts here, am I? I'm not taking you and stringing you along with, with these massive stories or anecdotes or anything else. All I'm doing is telling you what Paul said. He said, I don't fear death. And neither should you. Now as we gather together as God's people, one thing that we know is that he has conquered that. How is that knowledge going to change your life this week? How is it going to affect what you do and who you go to? How is it going to affect the way you approach your everyday tasks as well as the tasks which don't come around that often? If you have the knowledge that Jesus Christ has died for you, if you know that your sins are washed away and that in him you have life forever, if you know without a doubt that your salvation is secure and you rest in the loving arms of your Savior now and always, no matter what, how does that change how you approach this world? I leave that for you to contemplate this week. Fear not, for you are mine. I have called you by name, says the Lord. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us stand together and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and
We ask you, Lord, that you would reach out into our lives, that you would help us to forsake our way and follow yours, and that you would take away our sinful thoughts and fill our minds with your perfect will. We ask you, O Lord, that you would take away all tears, that you would give us hope, both in this life and in her life. And that because of our faithful witness, you would draw many, many people to the same hope that we experience. The hope that's in your name. Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy. Father Almighty, we pray for all those who are fearful of the COVID virus and its effects. We ask you that, number one, you would take this virus away from us. That you would cleanse us of this scourge. And also, number two, that as long as it is your will for this virus to dwell among us, that you would give us hope, that you would take away all fear, and that you would allow us to serve you with joy, even in the midst of a pandemic. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father Almighty, we also pray for those who are dealing with natural disasters, especially here in our own country, from hurricanes to windstorms to wildfires. Lord God, there's all sorts of things going on right now, and we know that you are with them, and you know what they need. We ask you, Lord, to be their powerful God. Show yourself in love and mercy through the arms of the rescuers and helpers. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father Almighty, we ask you to be with Neil and Jerry, with Bruce and Margaret and Chantel. We ask you, O oh God, that you would visit all those children of yours who need your hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, we pray for our homebound members, Gladys, Shirley, Linda, Tammy, Crystal, Carl, Joyce, and Penny. We ask you especially to continue to be with them as they, in many cases, are not able to be visited nearly as much as we would hope. We ask you, O oh God, that you would, you would take away all loneliness, fear, and anxiety and bring them nothing but hope and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father Almighty, we pray for the government and those who defend us, especially now in this time of unrest. We ask you, O oh Lord, to be with the United States Department of Justice. Make sure that they judge the laws fairly and according to your will alone. We ask you, O oh God, to be with the Eastern District Board of Directors, that all of their decisions may be pleasing to you and in accordance with your will. We ask you, O oh God, to bless all police officers, to give them courage and, and strength and patience, and Lord, to keep them doing only those things which are pleasing to you. Take away all sinful desires and fill them with resolve to bless your name. And we ask God that you would bless the members of the National Guard, especially those who are deployed right now. Lord, in your mercy. Father Almighty, we pray for all of the ministries of this congregation, for our Bible studies, for our choir, for the Concordia Seminaries in St. Louis, Fort Wayne, St. Catharines, and for Trinity in Lockport and Pastor God. We ask you, O oh God, to bless all of these, your ministries, in the name of Jesus, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, we pray for our family, our friends, our neighbors, for those who are hurting and those who need Christ. And we pray for all those we name in our hearts to you.
come within 15 minutes of the end of the service, and if you're going to be later, just give our office a call so that we know. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks. The Lord our God. That we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
throughout your days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you in favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing crown you with many times. 